So we're looking at Jesus' warning about hypocrisy from uh, Luke 11 and 12. And you'll see that there is an outline on page 12 of our conference booklet. Let's bow our heads to pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that as we gather here this morning, you are amongst us by your Holy Spirit. And we ask that you'd help us to hear your word and to understand it and believe it and obey it. Amen. Amen. Dave Patty is the founder director of Josiah Venture, which is a growing youth discipleship movement in Eastern Europe. And by the way, this is what they say about their name, Josiah Venture, which is relevant uh, in relation to our thinking about Josiah yesterday. They say, King Josiah began seeking God at age 16. By the time he was 26, God had used Josiah to bring revival to the land, rebuild the house of God, and restore the word of God to its central place. Central and Eastern Europe desperately needs its own Josiahs, young men and women who lead the way spiritually, as this young king did. Amen to that. And we need such young men and women, of course, not just in Central and Eastern Europe, but in Western Europe and in England as well. Dave Patty speaks about uh, dangers in leadership in general and hypocrisy in particular. And with reference to his context, which is the legacy of hypocritical state leaders in communist Eastern Europe. In fact, I heard him at a conference in Poland, which took place in a large, smart hotel in a ski resort village. And this hotel, I was told, used originally to be a retreat for Communist Party big cheeses. Anyway, Dave Patty told the story of one pastor he spoke to who taught his congregation, as their tradition demanded, that they should not watch TV or own, they should not have a TV in their own homes. And the pastor opened the door of a cupboard that he had in his house, and he showed Dave Patty the television that he had hidden inside the cupboard, away from the prying eyes of his congregation for his own personal use. And that is a great illustration. Say one thing up front and in public. Do something else hidden away and in private. And maintain the fiction deliberately. The word hypocrisy derives from that for actor in classical Greek theatre. Such an actor would wear a mask in front of his face. That is hypocrisy. A public mask hiding something different underneath. Now, let's be clear that the issue here is not failing to be perfect, unless, that is, you claim to be perfect. And some have made claims approaching that, the sinless perfectionists, and that is a form of hypocrisy. But sinning and repenting and sinning and repenting is the normal Christian life. That is why we start every service with a public and general confession of our sin and, uh, and, and uh, uh, asking the Lord for forgiveness. It's a public recognition that we do fail over and over. We depend on the grace of God and on his mercy daily. There is no doubt something of hypocrisy in us every time we disobey the Lord who we are committed to obeying. But that is very different, and it is a less serious form of hypocrisy uh, than the grave form of it that Jesus is excoriating in this teaching that we're looking at. William Taylor of uh, St. Helens Bishopsgate makes the point that when we apply these severe passages of Jesus' teaching about the Pharisees to the average faithful Christian struggling to walk by the Spirit, we do them a disservice and we give undue discouragement and we need to get the target of our application of this teaching right. Revisionist liberals who wear a mask of Christian orthodoxy, are the right target. And in my mind at the moment is the House of Bishops of the Church of England, every one of whose members voted to take note of their recent report, even if one was counted against having pressed the wrong button during the vote. That Church of England bishops' report on marriage and same-sex relationships, which is now uh, defunct, 
after General Synod would not even take note of it, was a study in institutional hypocrisy. And that is not just a gratuitous insult. That is rather an objective analysis of what the report was seeking to do. That is, on the surface, it was reaffirming the Church of England's biblical doctrine of marriage as between a man and woman for life and sex as belonging to marriage only. But under the surface, it was doing two other things. It was creating a deliberate fog of ambiguity and then under cover of this pea super, by means of such phrases as, quotes, maximum freedom, it was pushing on yet further down the road of affirming some extramarital sex, including some homosexual sex, as something God-endorsed and welcome in the life of the church, even if it shouldn't be given the label marriage. As the Bishop of Liverpool said in the debate, I quote, our explanation of maximum freedom will take us to places where we have not previously gone, precisely. Let's be clear also that strong teaching about a class of people, even ferocious teaching like the, like the teaching of Jesus here, can be appropriate even though it might not apply fully or even at all to some members of that class. Not all the Pharisees were the same. The Gospels make that clear. Jesus dealt with each individual individually. But that did not stop him characterizing the class of men. And sometimes that may need to be done. Not all the kings of Israel were the same, as we saw yesterday. But the Bible characterizes them in general as unfaithful. And they were. Not all bishops are the same, certainly not. But in the light of how things have been and are developing, the charge of general episcopal hypocrisy sticks. And it is hypocrisy that Jesus has in his sights at this dinner party, the hypocrisy in the first instance of the Pharisees. So look at Luke 11, 37 to 41. While Jesus was speaking... A Pharisee asked him to dine with him, so he went in and reclined at table. The Pharisee was astonished to see that Jesus did not first wash before dinner. And the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools! Did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give as alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. That genuine astonishment from this Pharisee was indicative of his priorities. The outward appearance mattered more than the inward righteousness. And the illustration that Jesus uses of the cup that's clean and shiny on the outside, but full of filth on the inside, gets right to the point. So Jesus draws the parallel between that cup and the man sat reclining beside him. These are not the kind of dinner party civilities that the Pharisee might have expected. You are full of greed and wickedness, you fools. An uncomfortable guest, to say the least. A fool is one who does not tremble at the word of God and so does not live wisely. That is the way of the Pharisees. Then Jesus, as it were, unpacks what he means by this hypocrisy by unleashing six woes on this host and his class of men. What does that word woe imply? It means that without repentance, the consequences of the curse will fall on you and you will miss out on all the blessing that Jesus has come to bring. It could hardly be a stronger word. Jesus reserves it for his most scathing denunciations. So let's t take a look at those woes one by one. So first of all, my first main heading, understanding hypocrisy. So this is the section from 1142 down to 54. Hypocrisy is no joke. 
It is a deadly, deadly serious matter, a matter of eternal life and death. And each of these woes highlights a different form of hypocrisy, or perhaps better, a different aspect of the one all-pervading hypocrisy. So woe one, superficial obedience, but deep disobedience. Verse 42, but woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Now, doing justice is loving people. So the Pharisees project this, this facade of obeying the law through their tithing, but they are failing to love people, they're failing to love their neighbor, and they're failing to love God. And since those are the two great commandments that sum up the whole law, the reality is that their show of obedience is actually masking a comprehensive failure to obey God's law. Woe to valuing status above God's word. Verse 43, Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe three, superficial attractiveness, but corruption under the surface. Under the surface. Verse 44, Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves, and people walk over them without knowing it. A shiny cup full of filth. A pleasant path hiding the corpse below. A whitewashed tomb is another illustration from the similar context in Matthew. Matthew 23, verse 27. You are like whitewashed tombs which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones. Brilliant white on the outside, death on the inside. These images from the lips of, lips of Jesus pile up painfully, superficially attractive, but underneath a disobedience that leads to death. The wages of sin is death. Jesus has come to give life. And this hypocrisy blocks the outpouring of life and blessing that Jesus longs to give. Woe for demanding an impossible obedience of others while living in disobedience. Verses 45 and 46. One of the lawyers answered him, Teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. If the cap fits lawyers, yes, you too. And Jesus said, Woe to you lawyers also, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe five, superficially honoring the prophets and the apostles, but in practice rejecting what they taught. Look at verses 47 to 51. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. So you are witnesses and you consent to the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them and you build their tombs. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. It was that generation in particular, of course, that crucified Jesus. And yet it was the sin of us all that sent Jesus to the cross. We all bear the guilt along with them. And their practice of honoring those whose teaching they had no intention of following continues to this day. Here's an example. There is a parish down the road from us that recently supplied its vicar to be the first bishop openly in a same-sex relationship. One of the members of this parish is a campaigner for the acceptance of same-sex relationships in the church, who is a retired Church of England vicar himself in a same-sex relationship. So he outright rejects the fundamental biblical and Christian sexual ethic. This morning, I opened our diocesan bulletin, as it happened, to find a large advertisement with a full-color portrait of Thomas Cranmer, on it. 
And it is from this parish. And it reads, As the Church of England remembers and celebrates the life and work of Thomas Cranmer on March the 21st, this parish church offers a celebration of the Holy Communion according to the Book of Common Prayer of 1549. And if I want further details of this celebratory event, I am asked to contact that retired vicar who campaigns for the acceptance of homosexual sex. What does Jesus say? You build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. Woe six, denying those under your influence the knowledge of the love of God through faith in Jesus. Verse 52, woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves and you hindered those who were entering. When we will not name sin as sin, and when we will not call people to repentance and faith in Christ, then we are leaving them enslaved by their sin and denying them the experience of the grace of God. Woe to us if we do that. We dare not do that. And then look at what happens next, verses 53 and 54. As he went away from there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to press Jesus hard and to provoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. And in so doing, they absolutely and emphatically make Jesus' point for him. It's all about their attitude to the word of Jesus. They are sitting over his word in judgment, not under his word in glad submission. So we need to understand that anatomy of hypocrisy. But we do that in order to avoid it. So secondly, beware hypocrisy in others and in ourselves. This is chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Why beware? Jesus gives us two reasons here. First of all, it spreads dangerously. 12, verse 1. In the meantime, when so many thousands of the people had gathered together that they were trampling one another, Jesus began to say to his disciples, first, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. We have a bread maker at home that sometimes even gets used. And you see that little bit of yeast, the leaven, at work. And how powerful it is. It works its way right through the dough. That is the point of leaven. And that is what hypocrisy does as well. It spreads dangerously. Secondly, it will be exposed completely. 12.2, nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. All hypocrisy will be exposed. We got a taste of that, maybe, through the synod vote, not even to take note of the bishop's report on sexual ethics in the life of the church. There comes a point where the mask begins to crumble. It gets seen through. Verse 3, Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. So we must watch our words. Say the same in public and in private. Guard your integrity. Words well up from the heart, the inside. So clean those things that are within, as Jesus says, by repentance and faith and the washing of the Holy Spirit. And don't be fooled by hypocrisy in others. And don't allow it to confuse you about the underlying reality of what's going on. We are prone to be fooled by it. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. The Lord sees, not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance. But the Lord looks on the heart. The Lord is not fooled. But we very easily are. We need to beware. And we need to be self-aware. We're not only prone to be fooled by hypocrisy in others, we're prone to practice hypocrisy ourselves as well. And we need constantly to be on the lookout for the log in our own eye. But then we need to be ready, as faithfulness to God's word demands, to speak about what we see around us 
if we're going to protect the flocks given into our care. So understand hypocrisy, beware hypocrisy in others and in ourselves. Nip it in the bud because otherwise it'll spread and it'll become very hard to root out. And thirdly, and finally, fear no one but God. Verses 4 to 7 of chapter 12. Jesus gives us the key to avoiding hypocrisy. One, do not fear men. Verse 4, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. As always, there is no being let, let off the hook when you're a disciple of Jesus. Lay down your very life in his service. That's what it's all about. What are we afraid of? Which side of physical death does our hope really lie? Do not fear men. Two, fear God, verse 5, but I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Three, then you need not fear. Verse 6, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies and not one of them is forgotten before God? Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, for you are of more value than many sparrows. Fear God who loves you and gives eternal life. Don't fear your enemies who hate you and who lead to death. My friends, Jesus says. And what a world of invitation and privilege and delight there is in that phrase on the lips of Jesus. Fearing men leads to enslavement. Fearing God leads to freedom and ironically and wonderfully to a lack of fear. Don't fear even those who kill. Fear God, fear not. That's the sequence and the route to fearless and free living in the service of the King of Kings. If you obey Christ without hypocrisy in public word and deed, you might even be killed, says Jesus. It could happen. But it's the worst that can happen. So nothing need make us fear because in that situation... And in any situation short of that, we are safe in the loving hands of our Heavenly Father. Let's bow our heads to pray. Lord Jesus, please help us to discern hypocrisy in ourselves and also in others. And Lord, please help us to avoid it. Amen.